can sequence a virus now in one or two days, develop an RNA I medication and gear up manufacturing. You can do that very quickly. And that's really the strategy we need to deploy. And I'll give you an example where we've actually done that. And we have a new danger uh, which emerged 30 years ago, the software virus. And they've actually become very sophisticated and, and actually quite dangerous because we have a lot of important systems that run on computers like 9-11 response systems and we fly airplanes by software. And, uh, and we've actually contained this danger quite well. Uh, if a new software virus is identified, uh, it is reverse engineered, an antidote is created, spread virally on the internet, and in 24 hours, we have a, an automatic response uh, to a, no, a new software virus. Uh, and nobody has taken the internet down, or even a portion of it, for even a second in 10 years. It's been a very successful track record. Now, it's not our software protection is not perfect by any means, but that's really the model we need to follow to develop a rapid response system to combat these particular dangers. And that's where the government comes in, in terms of enforcing certain ethical guidelines. Uh, for example, we shouldn't put particularly dangerous information on the web. Like you wouldn't want to put the design of, let's say, the 1918 flu virus on the web because that's dangerous information. But actually, the U.S. government has done that, exactly that. You can download the design of the 1918 flu virus uh, from the U.S. government's website. And Bill Joy and I, in this op-ed piece, criticized that. Uh, so that's a role. I mean, in fact, just recently there was some information how to build an atomic bomb from these Iraqi papers on the web. And everybody, and that was inadvertent, I guess, and everyone agreed that was not a good idea. There's no controversy about that. But so for some reason in the, in the biological realm, there's controversy about it because this, this dangerous information is still up there. So we need to actually have some guidelines to prevent clearly dangerous information from being widely disseminated. Some people do need that, that information. They could be given to, given the information in confidence with classified, you know, agreements and so on. Jacksonville, Florida. Hi, Ray. Thanks for being on CSAN. I really enjoy your show here. Uh, my question deals with uh, technology and behavior. I would define physical as technological versus uh, behavioral being emotional. Let me give you a quick example. Uh, all the cars here in Jacksonville seem to be equipped with turn signals, which are technological, yet only one in three people seem to use them, which to me is behavioral. They have the technology, but they don't behave with the technology. Uh, we pass laws, give them driving tests, you know, pretty much do everything we do, and yet can't get people to behave with the technology. Now, you've had a good lead into my question here speaking about destructive technology, which is to say technology is a two-edged sword, can be used for good or bad. Uh, my question for you is, when you've got six billion people on the planet, or six and a half billion people on the planet, that already have this ability to do what these machines are going to be able to do that you're talking about, and yet all these people, or the vast majority of them, don't seem to be behaving as well with the technology that the boss truth almighty's already given them kind of like one in three or two out of three drivers in jacksonville not using their turn signal uh, where do you see that this technology is going I, I don't quite understand how this technology is going to be that that boom to humanity when we already don't behave with the technology that we're given which let me put it in these terms we're not being, it doesn't seem we're being faithful with the little bit that we're already being given, so why are we going to be any more faithful with even more uh, developing well, it from a technological standpoint? Caller, thank, thank you. you. Well, it's a good question, and uh, actually to reinforce your question, I'll give you another example, which is people don't take advantage of all the health knowledge we have. Uh, there's actually a lot of knowledge we have already to dramatically reduce the likelihood of disease. You can reduce your likelihood of getting cancer or heart disease by, or diabetes by more than 90%. We can slow down the aging process. And many people, I'd say most people, don't take full advantage of this knowledge. Some people are health conscious, but even people who consider th themselves health conscious don't take advantage of all the knowledge that is out there. The, the thrust, though, of the technology is to make this easier and actually overcome this tendency that you articulated quite well of humans not to take advantage of all the knowledge 
in their vicinity. I mean, we know that you shouldn't tailgate, but lot, you know, most people do that, and, and we should take care of ourselves, and most, a lot of people don't do that. These future technologies will take that into account. I mean, for example, in, car, in the case of cars, which you mentioned, uh, there are collision avoidance systems that are going to actually take over the car if it senses that you're getting too close to another vehicle and uh, maybe not perfectly prevent accidents, but su substantially reduce them, even if you're not uh, doing all the things that you should do as a safe driver. Similarly, in health, while there's a lot that you should do to stay healthy, we're going to have drugs that actually turn off atherosclerosis. I mean, Pfizer's torcetrapeb, which is going through the approval mechanism, turns off one enzyme that destroys HDL in the blood. By inhibiting that enzyme, uh, HDL level soar in the phase two trial showed that this dramatically reduced atherosclerosis and Pfizer spending a record $1 billion on the phase three trials. That will actually, uh, if it meets its promise, and if not that drug, there'll be many others, will actually compensate for bad behavior and keep people healthy and reverse atherosclerosis. So at least eventually we'll be able to actually do that, uh, overcome cancer even if people are you know, not taking the steps to prevent cancer. So these technologies ultimately will step in to compensate for sort of, you know, the l inability of humans to, you know, be perfect in their behavior. Our guest has also written a few books on uh, dealing with uh, health issues. This is The 10% Solution for a Healthy Life and Fantastic Voyage, The Science Behind Radical Life Extension. Why are you interested in this topic? It used to be a separate interest. I had this interest being an inventor, principally with information technology and pattern recognition, as we discussed. And I had this separate interest in health. It started with the untimely death of my father when I was 22. He was 58. I'm actually 58 now. And uh, then in my mid-30s, I was diagnosed with type 2 diabetes and uh, tried the conventional approach. It actually made things worse. So I wrote the 10% solution. Uh, which was a successful health book, uh, really sharing the program I developed that overcame my own diabetes, and I've had uh, no type 2 diabetes for the last 20 years. What kind of program was that? Uh, basically nutrition, exercise, some supplements, uh, but mostly lifestyle and natural means, although there's some good drugs like metformin, I believe is actually an anti-aging drug, but also combats uh, type 2 diabetes. Uh, th then I confronted another health challenge, which was middle age, and actually been addressing the aging process and do a lot to slow down aging, and I believe we can do that. According to biological aging tests, I was about 38 biologically when I was 40, and according to these tests, I'm come out at 40 even though I'm 58. And these tests, uh, this controversy about them as to whether they're perfect, I think they're just you know one piece of information. but. In terms of the way I feel, I feel that I have slowed down the aging process. And there's really a lot of knowledge to do that. And this latest book, which came out two years ago, which I co-authored with Dr. Terry Grossman, a leading longevity expert in Denver, uh, articulates three bridges to radical life extension. And, and it's really a wake-up call for baby boomers, because bridge one is what you can do right now to slow down the aging process and disease process so that, and that, that by itself will not enable us to live hundreds of years. That will just keep us in good shape for another 10, 15, 20 years until we get to bridge two. And bridge two is the full flowering of this biotechnology revolution we've been talking about, which is proceeding exponentially, because we're doubling the amount of genetic data we sequence each year and the amount of proteomic data, and all, all these different aspects of biology are, pr are progressing exponentially. And 15 years from now, it's going to be a very different world where we can really reprogram the information processes underlying biology, and they fundamentally are information processes, and we're getting the tools to reprogram our bodies just like we reprogram our computers. And that will bring us to the third revolution, say 25 years from now, the nanotechnology revolution, the nanobots we talked about earlier, which can go inside our bodies and keep us healthy from inside. I mentioned there's already very interesting experiments along those lines in animals, but 25 years from now, we'll have very powerful nanobots that can go inside our bodies and keep us healthy at the cellular level. So it's a bridge to a bridge to a bridge. And you can get on bridge one now and, th and therefore be healthy and in good shape when bridge two comes around. That'll keep us to bridge three. So even baby boomers, people in their 50s, 60s, and even 70s, uh, and if you're really diligent, uh, 80s, can stay in good shape for another 
10 years, 15 years, when it really will be a different world. That's why the subtitle is Live Long Enough to Live Forever. Now, I mentioned these have been two separate interests, and I got interested in this because of my own health challenges and having had the experience with my father and realizing that as an inventor, I can find the ideas to overcome challenges, even if they're outside of my computer interest. But actually now, these two areas have merged. They're now the same uh, field because biology, medicine, health is undergoing a grand transformation from what used to not be an information technology. It was hit or miss. We just find something. Oh, here's something low as blood pressure. We don't know why this works. To where biology and medicine is becoming an information technology where we can actually understand it as information processes and reprogram those information processes. And the exciting thing about that is now that we can do that, we can actually, it's actually subject to this law of accelerating returns, this doubling of, of the power of these technologies every year. That didn't used to be the case before medicine was an information technology. But now that it is, uh, it's subject to this inherent acceleration. San Francisco, California. Uh, We've had Sherlin Newland on this program. And when he talks about what you're talking about as far as extension of life and things, uh, he was quoted as saying this. He says, people like Ray Kurzweil have forgotten. They're acting on the basic biological fear of death and extinction, and it distorts their rational approach to the human condition. Are you afraid of death? Uh, I think we should be. I think death is a great tragedy, and I think that's a very common view. Uh, we really haven't had much we could do about death and aging up until recently. So the response of the human uh, civilization has been to rationalize, oh, death, which is obviously a tragedy. It's a profound loss of knowledge and skill and personality and relationships and love and all kinds of things. Oh, that's really a good thing. That's really ennobling uh, in some abstract sense. Not that, not that these people actually want to die. In fact, people don't want to die unless they're in some profound pain is what we have found. But we've rationalized it as a good thing, and a lot of our philosophies and religions have been, have been geared towards that. And in my view, what's, a, what's ennobling of this you know, grand human project is, is the expansion of knowledge, and not as dr dusty information, but as music and art and all the things that, that enrich our lives, relationships. And all of that is robbed by, by disease, by aging, by death. And we're, we're gaining the tools to overcome that. Uh, it'll be a very different world. I, according to my models, in 15 years, we'll be adding more than a year every year to your remaining life expectancy, not just infant life expectancy. And so as you go forward, life expectancy will move on away from you. Uh, that's not a guarantee. Uh, but that does give us the ability then to live forever and, or live indefinitely. Because people say, well, these changes, how many more years will it provide us? Well, a particular change may add five years or ten years, but then you go another five, ten years and there's more changes that come. And you get to a point where there's a positive slope to the equation and as you go forward in time, there's, there's more progress enables you to go even further. And I think that's a positive thing. Uh, I think death is, is a great robber of what's, of what's meaningful to us. But this philosophy that death is a noble thing and, and that death gives meaning to life and death is the purpose of life, uh, is a very deeply rooted philosophy that, that uh, re really had no choice but to adopt because we had no alternative. Do you think it's an underlying drive of what you do? The reason you create a technology, you, read and you think about the technology and the future of it and life extension? Well, life, 